Okay, well, good morning, everyone. I, I know usually we have more people, but it's the storm. Sorry about that. We do have people uh, online uh, who joined this seminar, so there are many more people online than, <laughs> than here. Um, so uh, welcome to our Cancer Center seminar, and this particular event is also co-sponsored by the Institute for Global Cancer Prevention Research. And I'm really pleased to introduce Dr. Ramsey Saloon, who is an associate professor in the Department of Health Outcomes and Biomedical Informatics at the University of Florida College of Medicine. He is also the director of the Learning Health System Initiative uh, at the CTSI at University of Florida and the director of the Dissemination and Implementation Science Score within the CTSI. Uh, he has background in economics, master's and PhD degrees, and also completed postdoctoral fellowship in uh, cancer care quality uh, from uh, University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Um, so Dr. Salom's research focuses primarily on implementation and dissemination of evidence-based practices across diverse health uh, systems and policy settings. Uh, he is particularly focused on cancer prevention, uh, and uh, his research is actually really highly productive, uh, a lot of publications, but also very diverse funding portfolio. So he has uh, many grants uh, from NIH, Florida Department of Health, Patient Center Outcomes, Research Institute, Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. So these are kind of his research projects where he is PI or uh, co-investigator. Uh, a significant part is focused on tobacco, but uh, his portfolio is also um, diverse in terms of uh, research areas. Uh, some examples uh, of projects uh, are for example, a multi-level strategy to address disparities in rural HPV-related cancer prevention. Another example, point-of-care intervention to address financial toxicity in families facing pediatric cancer. Uh, so a lot of his research is focused on underserved and vulnerable populations. Uh, in addition to this outstanding research portfolio, he also teaches fundamentals of dissemination and implementation research and has a long list of service roles. Uh, one of our connections is uh, uh, he is now a co-chair of Global Research Network with the Society for Research on Nicotine and Tobacco. Before that, he was chair of the Global Cancer Research Special Interest Group with the American Society of Preventive Oncology. So um, after all this introduction. Lastly, I wanted to comment that from what I remember, Ramsey was offered uh, to come here in either in April or in February. There were two dates available. <laughs> he chose February. So this speaks to his courage and sense of adventure. So <laughs> that alone is a very interesting fact. So it's really great to have you here. Thank you. And without further delay, Thank you. Yours. Thank you, Dr. Stepanov, for the introduction. And I have to say my kids are really jealous because I, I get to see snow today. So <laughs> I'm very honored to be here. Uh, good morning, everyone who's in the room. And, and thank you for those who are joining via Zoom as well. Um, so I'm going to be talking about implementation science and tobacco control this morning. And just wanted to acknowledge uh, funding sources and no conflicts of interest. Uh, and uh, I'll start by talking about how I got here. So I started out as an economist and health services researcher uh, and somehow ended up as an implementation scientist uh, uh, several years later. I actually, the first time I visited the University of Minnesota, I was, a, uh, I think, completing my PhD in economics and came to visit ResDAC to learn more about using the Medicare data. So I started out uh, doing a lot of secondary data analysis and, and over time uh, became interested in conducting uh, in, and testing interventions and, uh, and, um, and also became interested during my postdoc in, in tobacco control specifically. Uh, and, uh, and when I moved to Florida, there was a really great uh, implementation uh, laboratory uh, that's a uh, PCORnet um, clinical 
a Cornet funded clinical data research network that really got me interested in, uh, in thinking about implementation science. And so, uh, so that's how I uh, married the two fields together, implementation science and tobacco control. And, and this, uh, in retrospect, makes a lot of sense because we have uh, a lot of evidence in, in tobacco uh, for, for tobacco control that's dating back decades. And there's been an implementation gap uh, of these evidence-based practices. Uh, and we've known about this implementation gap as far back as at least um, the early 2000s with the Surgeon General's report at the time, recognizing um, that implementation gap. Uh, and just to make sure that um, uh, in case anyone here is, is not familiar with implementation science, I imagine that many and most of you are. So I'll start with a definition from the National Cancer Institute uh, that defines implementation science as a study of methods to promote the adoption and integration of evidence-based practices, interventions, and policies into routine healthcare and public health settings to improve the impact on population health. Uh, so the focus is on how do we improve impact and, um, and moving what we know into, uh, in terms of uh, scientific discovery into the real world. Uh, and uh, this is a typical um, graph that shows where implementation science uh, stands in terms of the continuum of, of research, of translational research, and it's one of the last phases uh, typically. Uh, in, uh, in terms of translational research. Uh, some of you in the room here work in, the, uh, in some of the earlier stages of, of translational science and pre-intervention efficacy, efficacy studies and, um, uh, and know that uh, it takes many, many years for what's, what's discovered in the lab to make it out into the real world, especially into um, uh, disparate populations, vulnerable populations that may not see uh, the benefit of what we discover in the lab until um, several uh, decades from when it's discovered. And, and so the, uh, that's the rationale behind implementation science as a field to actually push the evidence um, in a concerted effort um, into the real world. Uh, and to do that, uh, one of the um, uh, unique aspects of, of implementation science in terms of study designs is using hybrid implementation effectiveness studies to uh, to speed up the uh, to trans the translation of evidence into into practice. Uh, and so, implementation science is a multidisciplinary field. A lot of the research methods that we use uh, come from other uh, other disciplines. However, this is somewhat unique in terms of having um, designing studies that. Um, combine both a, an emphasis on effectiveness as well as implementation outcomes. Uh, and the rationale here is instead of waiting until we demonstrate uh, effectiveness at a population level and then figure out how to close the implementation gap, we should be thinking about doing this at uh, simultaneously. Uh, and, uh, and I think the biggest challenge is to, um, to challenge uh, scientists who work in the lab in terms of designing, um, designing interventions early on for widespread implementation. So the challenge is, is how, do you, uh, how do you think about implementation earlier? Uh, and we have different um, degrees or um, types of hybrid designs uh, with hybrid type one designs having a primary focus on effectiveness uh, where there's still a need to demonstrate effectiveness uh, while understanding the implementation context all the way to hybrid type threes where we have a lot of evidence about effectiveness. Perhaps it hasn't been uh, tested in the uh, specific setting that we're in. Uh, so we're focusing on implementation outcomes, understanding what strategies are needed and how which strategies are successful in terms of pushing the evidence out while at the same time still keeping an eye on effectiveness and making sure that uh, the interventions are effective. Um, this is another um, a schematic of a, of a subway um, analogy for uh, understanding when to ask the questions uh, in terms of uh, what study design to use. Uh, and it takes, it takes us from 
uh, looking at the intervention, deciding whether we have evidence of efficacy. Uh, if yes, then we'll move to effectiveness. And then uh, when we're at that point, we can ask our question, uh, our, ourselves whether a hybrid um, effectiveness uh, implementation trial is needed. Uh, and, uh, and typically, uh, if we have evidence of effectiveness, then typically either a hybrid uh, effectiveness implementation trial is warranted or a, uh, uh, an implementation trial that focuses on implementation outcomes is needed. Uh, so I'll bring this to, uh, to my research now and uh, have several uh, ongoing hybrid uh, implementation effectiveness trials. Uh, and I'll focus on studies in, in tobacco control. So this is um, um, in terms of uh, looking at a, a study that's focusing on mobile health aids for smoking cessation. Uh, and the scientific rationale for this was uh, basically summarized in the 2020 Surgeon General's report uh, that identified that was focused on smoking cessation uh, the Surgeon General's reports, uh, when they come out, they usually have a thematic uh, focus area. And so uh, the 2020 report was focused on smoking cessation. It recognized that there's a proliferation of, uh, of mobile health aids that um, uh, are in the U.S. and, and across the world, uh, but also recognized that many of them uh, do not have sufficient evidence behind them. Uh, and we also don't know how these um, mobile health aids perform against more of the traditional um, uh, smoking cessation treatments like the quit line that has been imp wide, uh, implemented um, across the U.S. and across the world. Uh, so with that research need, we um, designed a comparative effectiveness trial that's been funded through uh, PCORI. Uh, and, um, uh, focusing on evaluating the comparative effectiveness of uh, mobile health options. So one of them is called I Can Quit. This was developed by uh, uh, Jonathan Bricker at the Fred Hutch Institute uh, that uses acceptance and commitment therapy to, uh, to promote smoking cessation. Uh, and it's been demonstrated to be effective in, in several trials. Uh, so we're, use, we're testing I, I Can Quit uh, we're also testing in a second arm, we're testing I can quit with uh, another uh, smoking cessation strategy that has been converted, converted to a um, uh, mobile health aid, and that's um, called Motivate, developed by Jesse Dallary at the University of Florida. Uh, we're combining those uh, two options into one, one app, uh, and we're testing uh, the effectiveness of those two apps against the Florida quit line, which is uh, we consider that as a standard of care. Um, so in addition to testing the comparative effectiveness of the interventions, we're looking into how uh, and for whom these interventions work. We have a focus on vulnerable populations um, in the state of Florida. Uh, and we're also interested in implementing this within a system of care. So we're focusing on primary care uh, and we want to understand the barriers and facilitators um, to implementing these interventions in clinical practice. And so that's where the implementation component of the trial comes in. We also just last week published the uh, protocol um, uh, for that trial. So it should be available uh, online soon. Um, so these are the, the different arms that I talked about. So I can quit, I can quit plus motivate, which is uh, contingency management. It's um, also an evidence-based intervention that uh, has been shown to be effective uh, to in smoking cessation and other behavior change uh, interventions and then uh, the Florida quit line as a um, standard of care. Uh, so this is our natural laboratory where we're doing this research. Uh, this is a uh, clinical research network called One Florida Plus. Uh, used to be One Florida, and we've expanded to include uh, the UAB health system as well as Emory uh, health system recently. This has uh, been funded uh, through uh, PCORnet, and uh, the University of Florida serves as the uh, 
coordinating center and, and the uh, network is primarily a data research network. We have data on over 20 million uh, patients uh, from more than 12 healthcare systems. Some of them are academic health centers, some of them are not. Uh, and we've also uh, work within this network to, uh, to design implementation trials and, and other types of trials, pragmatic trials. Um, we're focusing in this study on the uh, north central uh, Florida region. That's um, where Gainesville is, that star at the top. Um, and that uh, part of the state is uh, predominantly rural. Uh, we also see uh, a lot of tobacco use and a lot of uh, a large burden associated with uh, tobacco use in terms of uh, uh, high prevalence of lung cancer and, and other tobacco-related cancers in, in that part of the state. And we're focusing on two healthcare um, systems, UF Health and a, a network of federally qualified health centers that, we'll be, that we're working with. Um, so in terms of the implementation evaluation, we're using uh, REAIM as a framework, and many of you are, are probably familiar with the REAIM because it's, it's been around for a long time. Uh, it's been used in, in many fields. And what REAIM does is uh, it's a really flexible framework that uh, helps us to think about other outcomes beyond effectiveness. So uh, it, it's, uh, it starts with reach as a primary outcome. So how, how do we reach the targeted population that we're interested in? Uh, but then also goes into uh, outcomes like adoption. Uh, so if we're implementing this in a system of care, we care about what, uh, which clinicians are actually uh, using the intervention, which clinicians are not, uh, what are the differences at the clinician level, at the clinic level. If, if you're working with schools, for example, you could replace clinician for teacher, uh, et cetera. Uh, and then we look at implementation outcomes. Uh, we look at questions related to how well the intervention has been implemented. So things like fidelity. Uh, we also care about implementation costs. Uh, and finally, we want to look at the effect over time of the intervention. Uh, and the reason why this is so important, so this, um, so REAIM was uh, originally developed by Russ Glasgow and, and this recent paper by Russ Glasgow and colleagues uh, has this table that really demonstrates how uh, REAIM works to measure population impact and why is it so important. Uh, so if you take uh, an intervention that let's say is 50% effective and we know for example from smoking cessation that um, there's really no intervention that is that effective uh, or demonstrated to be that effective. Um, so hypothetically, we have an, uh, an intervention that's 50% effective. If we take that intervention and then implement it in the real world, uh, and we consider that uh, we're implementing this in clinics, only 50% of clinics are going to decide to use the intervention. Now that impact has been cut by half, uh, and then within each clinic, if we assume that only half of the clinicians uh, decide to use the intervention and the other half does not, then we also cut that impact by half. Um, same thing if we look at patients and see which patients decide to use the intervention, which do not. Um, all of a sudden, we're dropping from an uh, um, intervention that has been shown to be 50% efficacious in the laboratory to an intervention that only impacts one and a half percent of the population. And so this is how we're using uh, REAIM in, in our study. Uh, so we're looking at um, using automated data from the electronic health record then also uh, data that we collect um, uh, from the research component of, of the trial. Uh, with, with patients in the clinic uh, to measure reach. Uh, so reach usually is at the patient level and then adoption is at the clinic and clinician level uh, in terms of uh, the provider side of things. Um, and then we're also measuring uh, fidelity of the intervention, how it's delivered or the three interventions that we have here. Um, the uh, and then 
uh, also looking at, at maintenance. Another thing that we're going to be focusing on is the adaptation, how the intervention uh, changes over time uh, as we uh, progress with the trial over, over the next three years. Uh, this is, uh, turns out to be a really important um, implementation outcome that we need to develop methods to better understand how adaptations impact um, our outcomes our, and basically population impact over time. Another aspect of the study design is making sure that we are designing a trial that's as pragmatic as possible. And to do that, there's a really nice tool uh, called the Pressies 2 that can be used at the time of a trial design that we actually use to design this trial. Uh, and so it asks you questions about, um, uh, rel uh, with respect to the design. So we start with eligibility, for example, who is selected to participate in the trial. Um, and the more, uh, inclusion exclusion criteria that you have the less pragmatic your trial is going to be so uh, you're thinking so this forces you as you're designing your trial to be more pragmatic about um, about designing the trial and the recommendation is to uh, work on this with your stakeholders when you're designing the trial and so one aspect of uh, of this project is that we have a, a large stakeholder advisory committee we have within one Florida, we have a citizen scientist program uh, that's um, composed of patient partners uh, that and, and they use they decided to call themselves citizen scientists. Uh, so that's uh, supported by our CTSI uh, by the Cancer Center and we work with them on every phase of, of a of a project starting with uh, pre-proposal designing the study and so they help us answer these questions. So the ratings here. Uh, I guess um, I've, I get asked whether, uh, you know, how do you decide whether you're a one or a two or a five? I think that's less important than actually uh, asking yourself and, um, and others those questions before you um, design your study or decide on the final design. So this is uh, how we operationalized um, uh, th those scores based on our study. So I'll give another example. Um, so, for example, the, um, the setting where the trial is being done, uh, we want it to be as inclusive as possible. So not only are we working with academic, large academic health centers that may have more resources to support uh, the uh, delivery of the interventions, but we're actually we're also working with uh, community based clinics as well that have less resources and are less uh, accustomed to working with researchers. Um, so I'll switch gears now to talk about a different um, uh, focus area uh, with, uh, toba with tobacco cessation, and that's uh, working with uh, patients with cancer. Um, and this is another area where we have uh, a lot of evidence uh, for, uh, for interventions. Um, and um, most recently, there was a uh, NCI tobacco control monograph. That was published last year that uh, I had the opportunity to contribute to. So this was uh, based on uh, over a, a decade of um, working uh, groups and um, recognition that there's an implementation gap uh, in delivering smoking cessation to uh, cancer patients who to continue to smoke after their cancer diagnosis. Um, many in a survey done about 10 years ago, there was uh, found that the majority of NCI designated cancer centers did not have uh, dedicated programs uh, for smoking cessation. And so, um, and given the evidence uh, of, um, of the harms of tobacco use after a cancer diagnosis, uh, there's, there's been an effort uh, to address these uh, implementation barriers. So there are multi-level barriers in terms of implementing smoking cessation in cancer care settings. Uh, and the NCI implemented a, um, I'll skip to this slide. So the NCI implemented a uh, 
uh, an initiative that started in 2017 uh, to advance the implementation of smoking cessation programs at NCI designated cancer centers and over three cohorts, they funded uh, 52 uh, cancer centers, including uh, the University of Minnesota Cancer Center. Um, and during that time, we also contributed to the evidence uh, or the, the case for, um, for implementing these programs. So uh, this is uh, focused on the cost of demonstrating that the cost of uh, a treatment failure that's attributable to tobacco use based on the evidence from the 2014 Surgeon General's report uh, and basically found that um, this equates to about $11,000 per uh, patient who continues to smoke uh, and, um, and about $3.4 billion uh, for all patients with uh, cancer who are diagnosed annually in the United States. <clears throat> um, so, uh, so at, um, at UF Health, um, even though we weren't part of the uh, C3I, um, we also uh, implemented similar uh, programs to, to better understand the implementation gaps. And we found similar uh, types of uh, barriers to implementation of, um, uh, of tobacco treatment um, at our cancer center. We've also looked into um, the EHR documentation of um, of tobacco use and, and found barriers also in uh, documentation uh, that was um, compared to the uh, tumor, the uh, tobacco use status in the tumor registry. We use that as a, as a gold standard. So we were able to compare what we had in EPIC versus um, what's, what's actually documented in the tumor registry and, and um, found differences in terms of um, better documentation for tobacco related cancers and uh, other cancers. Um, and, um, and so some of the interventions that are used in EPIC in terms of the automated referral are things that we have implemented locally as well. Uh, and I've had the opportunity to work with C3I to uh, conduct an, uh, an evaluation of the implementation costs associated with these programs. So we've had uh, 15 cancer centers participate so far, uh, and, um, and we found that uh, on average, the cost per quit was about $2,600, which is uh, per cancer patient, which is uh, very reasonable compared to other types of uh, prevention interventions in this population. Um, and the way we did this was looking at uh, the different programs that uh, these cancer centers had implemented. And this was a pragmatic approach that NCI took in terms of not dictating what each cancer center uh, offered in terms, of, um, in terms of their smoking cessation program. So we saw very uh, different uh, types of uh, treatment strategies implemented across the cancer centers. And this was actually not a, a research project. This was an implementation initiative. Uh, so that made sense. Um, and we focused on uh, really the operation costs associated with keeping the program running after it had been uh, implemented. And we, we also, uh, for, for some cancer centers, we also looked at um, the initial implementation costs as well. Uh, things that you don't measure in terms of uh, the implementation costs in this case are uh, research related costs because those would not be um, necessary if you're replicating this type of program somewhere else. Uh, and we looked at um, costs from the perspective of the tobacco treatment program or health system uh, implementing the tobacco treatment program. And so we also we found that most of the costs were uh, associated with personnel about 90% across the board uh, of the implementation costs were uh, personnel costs, but we also captured costs related to medications, to education and promotional materials, uh, staff trainings, uh, and uh, technology, um, any EHR modifications, uh, 
uh, for example, and also uh, equipment and space. Uh, we're continuing to work with those data and uh, we currently have uh, a paper under review that is looking at the efficiency or the performance of uh, these programs relative to each other. So we were able to use a method called data envelopment analysis, which is a mathematical optimization technique that's used in um, uh, economics and, and industrial engineering to look at the um, the ratio of inputs to outputs in a in a production function and be able to compare uh, programs against each other uh, in terms of uh, inputs and outputs simultaneously. So we're looking here at um, cost per patient as our, um, our input and then we're looking at program reach and effectiveness um, uh, as our outputs from the programs or our outcomes. Uh, and um, what we see, first of all, this is not um, what you typically see in, in typical examples of these because we have an outlier. Program one at the top is uh, the most efficient and uh, by far compared to some of the other programs in terms of both reach and effectiveness. Uh, so the way to read this is that you're, the closer you are to the origin, the less efficient uh, the program is and the further away um, the more efficient uh, and and so we have we can then go back and look at these programs in terms of their characteristics uh, for example how many um, tobacco treatment specialists they had and some of the other inputs that they use what types of strategies they uh, delivered um, uh, and see where they landed in terms of their relative efficiency uh, what we also can tell here is that notice that blue line that uh, basically divides the programs that had a greater emphasis on effectiveness at the expense of reach versus uh, programs that focused more on reach versus effectiveness. So we saw different approaches taken by the cancer centers. Some of them uh, used more automated approaches, were able to reach more of their patients that way, uh, while others had a greater emphasis on intensive counseling programs that required a lot of resources, but may not have reached as, as many patients as uh, the programs that emphasized using more automated um, methods. Uh, and um, uh, this focus on cost and efficiency um, also led, led us to think about sustainability. So, at this point, none of these programs are funded by NCI anymore, uh, and uh, sustainability is a major um, focus. Originally, also, when, when these programs were designed, they had to su submit sustainability plans. Uh, and, um, and so we're interested in better understanding the mechanisms and determinants of sustainability for, for these programs. This was a very large natural experiment that occurred. Uh, and we're hoping to uh, understand, um, to better understand how sustainability works in this never before experiment. Um, so we have a new grant that um, we're hoping to be able to start here in the next few weeks that will focus on sustainability of the C3I. Uh, and we're gonna be using an implementation mapping approach that will basically involve working with uh, our stakeholders from C3I and working uh, using mixed methods to work backwards in terms of starting with outcomes and working our way backwards into uh, understanding what strategies were used to achieve those outcomes uh, and then also looking at um, other determinants of uh, sustainability which is our main outcome and what we hope to produce from that project is a toolkit that can help cancer centers uh, develop sustainable uh, tobacco treatment programs. Um, we're using a tool called the Clinical Sustainability Assessment Tool uh, that has of seven domains on the right that was uh, developed by Doug Luke at Washington University that um, can measure sustainability capacity. So that's one of the key instruments that we're using in, in that project. Looking at the time, so I'm going to switch gears again for the last time and talk about um, a little bit about our work in global tobacco control. Uh, 
Uh, and that's where um, Irina and I meet in terms of uh, our interests with the SRNT Global Research Network. Um, so with uh, the progress that's been made uh, in terms of tobacco control in the US and other high income countries, the burden has shifted uh, to low and middle income countries where uh, the majority of uh, people who use tobacco products live uh, nowadays. So um, this is also a, uh, an area that uh, is ripe for more implementation science because we have the tools that we need. The WHO uh, has a, uh, a far-reaching treaty, the FCTC, uh, that also has attached um, uh, basically tools to it. The MPOWER uh, is one of those um, tools that can help countries implement evidence-based practices in tobacco control. So we know what the uh, what the uh, interventions are, the problem is, is actually in implementation. Uh, and, um, and we've worked in um, different areas of um, the FCTC. Um, the FCTC is broken into articles that um, uh, range from focusing on things like health warning labels to Article 14 that focuses on smoking cessation uh, interventions to uh, uh, to Article 6 that focuses on taxation and um, economic interventions to curb tobacco control. And so we've uh, recently um, summarized um, uh, sort of the rationale for intervening and using applying implementation science in, in global tobacco control, um, <clears throat> arguing that uh, the in increasing the reach and impact of the FCTC globally requires increasing adoption of FCTC and MPOWER measures uh, in, the, in the form of tobacco control policies and programs and ensuring the successful dissemination implementation of these measures. Uh, and these efforts have to be tailored to specific uh, regulatory environments and cultural environments uh, in each country. Um, this is from my earlier work that um, used discrete choice experiments to advance the implementation of, of health warning labels. Um, so discrete choice experiments are a survey uh, based technique that um, uh, uses repeated measures to better understand preferences. So we've used them with um, uh, people who smoke uh, to better understand how they react to um, to tobacco products and, and their packaging, but also to health warning labels. Um, and, and so uh, we've done this, we've done some of this work with my colleagues in the US as well as uh, other countries in, in Latin America. Uh, and, um, and also uh, published a systematic review uh, on using uh, discrete choice experiments as an implementation size, science tool to help us better understand stakeholder um, perspectives when implementing uh, new interventions. Um, we've also recently focused on the transfer of uh, the interventions and their ad adaptability from a high income country where most of these uh, evidence based interventions are developed to where they're needed nowadays in low and middle income countries and other low resource settings. Uh, and so we took this, this implementation science framework that focuses on the transfer of interventions and, and their transferability uh, and um, recently focused on how this, this is applied in, um, in cancer control interventions and global cancer uh, prevention control provided examples uh, in, in this article of, of how this is uh, done in collaboration with partners in, in LMICs. <clears throat> and so the, the region that I focus on in, in my work is the Eastern Mediterranean region. Um, and uh, this is uh, actually happens to be the only region uh, in terms of the WHO regions that is expected to have a projected increase in tobacco use overall uh, by 2025 uh, and has very low um, implementation rates in terms of the FCTC and, and MPOWER measures. Uh, this region, as you know, has uh, suffers from 
uh, major political instabilities and, and very weak public health infrastructure and, and other, um, other infra infrastructure weaknesses. Um, and uh, also unique to this region is the specific use of water pipe tobacco use um, that is as prevalent uh, and in some, some, some places more prevalent than cigarette smoking. And so we've developed uh, a, a suggested a regulatory framework for water pipe tobacco that um, uh, focuses on the unique aspects of, of tobacco use, which in, in that part of the world, it's used on a daily basis. So uh, the specific uh, burden from water pipe tobacco is, um, is really high uh, in that region compared to um, in the United States where it's used more um, on an irregular basis. Uh, and we've also worked in the area of um, uh, focusing on developing the uh, economic evidence for uh, intervening with water pipe tobacco, um, based, basing our research on the uh, NCI's work to summarize the evidence on the economics of tobacco control in general, uh, which uh, with the 2016 monograph focused on um, you know, stating that uh, the adjusting or intervening with the price of tobacco is perhaps the single most uh, consistently effective tool for uh, reducing tobacco use. And so with funding from the International Development Research Center in Canada and Cancer Research UK, uh, we've um, conducted surveys in uh, three countries in, in the region. Uh, to first collect the, uh, the data on surveillance, which didn't exist. Uh, we didn't have contemporary data on, on uh, uh, tobacco use um, uh, in these countries. And then we uh, used discrete choice experiments to model the demand um, for tobacco use, focusing on cigarette smoking and water pipe tobacco. Uh, and we were able to, with, with these uh, surveys then, uh, calculate the price elasticity uh, of, of each uh, tobacco product uh, and, and also look at cross price elasticity, uh, which gives us an idea whether these products are used as substitutes or whether they're used in tandem when uh, the price of a tobacco is uh, changed due to more um, uh, taxes. Uh, and, and this work has led us to a um, new study now focusing on uh, the implementation of uh, smoking cessation uh, in Lebanon, where um, uh, the burden of tobacco use is, is very high. About two thirds of the, po the adult population uh, smoke either cigarettes or water pipe tobacco. Um, and, um, and so we're working on uh, testing uh, evidence-based interventions from the FCTC and, and, and from the WHO um, uh, within a system of care there, the primary health care system. Um, and uh, so our project aims are to adapt an existing smoking cessation program at the American University of Beirut that serves that community. Uh, to be able to serve the the public primary health care system uh, in in the country and we're modeling this as a, a sort of a quit line uh, type uh, intervention that would be linked to uh, patients in the primary care setting uh, and so we're going to follow that with a trial of the uh, effectiveness of, of the different interventions uh, and um, their cost effectiveness uh, and I'll show that in the next slide. And then also, this is a hybrid implementation effectiveness trial. So we'll be uh, also focusing on implementation outcomes, including the sustainability of, um, of these interventions, working closely with the uh, Ministry of Health there. Um, so these are the interventions that we're testing. We have three arms. Um, the first one is the standard of care, which is ask, advise, assist. Um, given that there isn't a functional quit line in, in the country. Uh, and, um, and then we're going to test that against Ask, Advise, Connect, uh, which will connect patients to, to the quit line. Uh, 
And because we're working in a low resource setting, we're also going to be testing the effectiveness and cost effectiveness of nicotine replacement therapy. Even though this is standard of care in a high income country like the US, we wanna make sure that the incremental benefit of uh, using nicotine replacement therapy in a place where it's not readily available and is um, not always affordable is actually cost effectiveness in, in this setting. So that's why we have a third arm for that. Um, uh, and we have these interventions operating at multiple levels at the clinic provider and patient level because we have, uh, again, a multi-level problem, just like with uh, the other uh, examples that I discussed earlier. Um, and this is our conceptual model. We're, fo we're focusing on smoking abstinence at six months as our primary outcome. Uh, on the left, we have our intervention components operating at the clinic, provider, and patient level. Uh, and uh, in this mixed method study, we're going to be focusing on um, several moderators and context contextual factors. Uh, we're using an implementation science framework to guide that evaluation um, and, and also looking at some of the mediators of, of the interventions on, uh, on our primary outcome. And, um, and finally, uh, to close, I wanna bring this back home to uh, remind us of why, we're, why implementation science is so important, and that's really to achieve health equity. Um, we wanna make sure that scientific discoveries are reaching everyone in an equitable uh, fashion. And I really like this, um, this article by Anna Bauman and, and Leo Kalbasa, again, at, at Washington University, um, that, has uh, basically a prescription for us to how to make sure that we are explicitly focusing on health equity uh, when conducting implementation science. And there's been uh, several um, uh, there's been several efforts to to re refocus and reframe implementation science to address inequities over the past few years, including a specific frameworks that address health equity. Uh, and so. Um, so what they recommend is to focus on reach from the very beginning. And earlier I, sh I showed that slide that uh, shows why uh, we should start with reach and, and focus on uh, all these implementation outcomes to make sure that we are understanding the impact, the, full, the true impact of our interventions in the real world uh, and who we're leaving behind at every step. Um, so this happens at uh, the level of reach with patients, but also with our choice of settings, our clinics, our schools, um, the intervention targets, the, the, the clinicians that we work with. Um, there are opportunities to improve equity at, at every step. Um, and um, also another recommendation is to design the, um, these interventions with vulnerable populations in mind from the beginning. Uh, and uh, specifically select implementation strategies, uh, basically being purposeful about um, helping to reduce inequities uh, using those implementation uh, strategies. And we really need to develop the science of adaptation um, because these discoveries that, are, um, that take place in a really controlled environment and an experiment may not transfer to the real world very well, may leave um, uh, some of our intended target populations behind. So we really need to understand how to adapt these interventions to make sure that they are reaching their intended audiences when we shift from the controlled lab environment to, a, to another setting. Um, and then also focusing on implementation outcomes and focusing on equity and the choice of implementation outcomes and the evaluation of implementation outcomes. Um, and uh, so one of the um, um, efforts I've been involved with is a working group uh, on at the intersection of economics and implementation science that's developed several um, uh, papers over the past um, two or three years. Uh, and one of these papers was focused on the economics of adaptation. We, we don't have um, really good methods yet uh, in terms of how and, and also uh, what to focus on in terms of measuring adaptations. But 
thinking about um, when conducting an economic evaluation, thinking about the different um, uh, pieces of, of, um, of the puzzle, focusing on, uh, you know, when you basically dichotomize the, uh, the uh, intervention, the implementation strategy, and then the downstream costs of, of, um, of the evaluation, then you can start thinking about where the adaptations are occurring and recognizing that adaptations are uh, the rule rather than the exception, that you are going to have adaptations when you implement an intervention in a new setting. Uh, and this is something that's going to be dynamic over time. Uh, but then understanding what adaptations are occurring to the intervention uh, and what adaptations are needed to your implementation strategy over time, uh, and then how that affects the downstream costs related to uh, the consequences of, of your intervention. Um, and finally, I'll close with this um, uh, quote that uh, recognizes the role of adaptations and recognizes that we should um, uh, act early, uh, which is uh, the impetus for, for having hybrid uh, implementation effectiveness uh, designs. Uh, we have to do the best we know at the moment, uh, but realize basically that adaptations will be needed um, over time. So thank you and uh, happy to answer questions. Thanks. Um, th that was really inspiring, really impressive. I'm Abby Benio. We're going to meet later today, so I have a lot of things I want to talk to you about. But for the shared audience, I guess one thought that's coming to my mind, I'm a clinician. Um, and, you know, some of the threats to sustainability and adoption that you talk about in, in tobacco cessation in the United States that are coming to mind are policies related to reimbursement for treatment, right? in a clinical setting and then also you know burnout amongst primary care providers i mean i think uh there are, there are a lot of ways that which we want to help primary care providers improve i study lung cancer screening so it's kind of similar to this but those two areas seem to be real threats to us making a whole lot of progress in the real world what are your thoughts on those <laughs> are you going to be able to solve those for me this morning <laughs> yes <laughs> no just kidding yeah i don't think um so we've been talking about these uh, things over the past five years with C3I. We have uh, all these working groups. Um, uh, I mean, one thing about sustainability is that we have to align our interventions with our different levels of, of our settings that we have, our environments. We have to align, we have to make sure that um, what we're proposing as a solution is aligned with our internal organizational setting, but also with, with the external policy environment. Uh, and unfortunately, those things aren't always aligned. And, um, uh, and um, so that's, I mean, that's sort of where things need to be headed is, is continuing to adapt what we're doing to, um, to align with first the policy environment. Um, hopefully there will be uh, efforts to uh, change the reimbursement model, uh, especially in the oncology setting. It doesn't make financial sense to address tobacco use. Uh, other ways to intervene are to, um, to extend the intervention outside of the clinical encounter because of physician burnout, because of the, um, just the the, the, um, uh, the competing priorities in a clinical setting. Uh, and so um, as our technologies improve and the reach of these technologies improve and, and they become more equitable, uh, there's an opportunity to um, uh, do, do more things with the patient portal, with, with the electronic health record that will help us extend the, um, the reach of, of the clinic or what's being done in the clinic. Uh, so, so both of these things, I think, are really important over time. I, I, I'm, I'm Dougie. I'm the Cancer Center Director. This is a variant of Abby's question. So we, we were a C3I pilot site, and I think one of our former faculty members, Ann Joseph, ran a pretty successful program. And when the NCI funding ended, we went to our hospital system and said, see, this works. Can you help support this? And they basically said no. 
um, I don't know if Dorothy has a better memory of it than I do, but <laughs> they basically said no. So anyway, that's the framing, the example, but the, fra the question I really want to ask, whose economic interest is it to get people to stop smoking? Obviously, the economic interest of people to start smoking, continue smoking is obvious. And, you know, when I'm wearing my most cynical hat, I say, well, you know, the healthcare system doesn't really want people to smoke. Abby's business, my business is sort of dependent on tobacco. Um, Big Pharma, I don't think, wants people to stop smoking either. Otherwise, they wouldn't keep making drugs uh, for, you know, various lung cancers and head and neck and bladder cancer. So who should be paying for this? Who should be responsible? I mean, you know, one obviously is the federal government, but I would say insurance companies have never supported this effort either, which I think is in their economic interest. So anyway, what's your, what do you, how do you think we should get this funded? Ab uh, yeah, so absolutely. So, so you're right that in, in terms of um, the uh, healthcare delivery system, sometimes there's a disincentive for them to, to get people to stop smoking financially. Uh, and um, uh, same thing with, with uh, insurance companies because they often don't um, keep the patient long enough to, to reap the benefits of, um, of smoking cessation. Um, at least in, in, in the uh, U.S. healthcare system, that's a really difficult um, question to answer. Uh, there's been efforts by my colleagues in, in Canada and Australia and other places that have been more successful recently in terms of focusing on, on cancer, addressing smoking cessation in cancer uh, patients. Most notably in, in Canada, there's been a, uh, now a, a, a national effort to implement um, a similar program across the provinces that has been uh, very successful. Um, so, so here in the U.S., I think it has to go beyond the economics. It has to be. Um, uh, I think we have to get the message out about uh, basically um, doing the right thing and and um, and basically making this associated with the image of, of the healthcare system in, in terms of uh, something that uh, becomes a competitive advantage, that this is something that they have. So we have a long way to go. And then obviously if there are financial incentives uh, built into reimbursement, um, then that may be another way, um, starting with, uh, with, with public insurance, with Medicare, uh, Medicaid, uh, in, in each state, um, but it's it's much more difficult to do in the U.S. All right, if there are no more questions. Oh, Chris. Yeah, the, um, I'm a basic scientist. I don't have a, you know, clinical trials background or anything, but it seems to me that it, 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 with your implementation uh, trials, it, it's not one size fits all, is it? I mean, you've got different vulnerable populations that you're trying to target. So how do you account for that heterogeneity? Do you have slightly different approaches for different populations or, or do you then just try to parse out at work for this group and not for that group? Um, yeah, so that's, that's a great question. I mean, recognizing that um, this is why adaptations are, are, are really important, uh, I think, in, in implementation science, the concept of, of understanding what's being adapted um, when you take an intervention to a new setting. Um, there's also uh, the recognition of understanding what are the key ingredients to, to an intervention. So really understanding the core components, and I think that was on the slide on the economics of adaptation. Uh, it's probably really small, I can't see it, but um, basically understanding what are the core components of an intervention, what are the active ingredients that are leading to the outcomes, and then you have the, 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 the periphery that's adaptive, that you're able to adapt and repackage in a, in a new setting. Uh, I think this is really important and uh, difficult to do with uh, perhaps quantitative methods alone, and that's why we use a lot of mixed methods to, to understand um, the core components of an intervention and what the adaptive periphery is. Are there any other questions? And let's go ahead and say thank you one more time to Dr. Sloan. Thank you.